Hey, really quick, before we get into the podcast, we aim to bring you the most practical, impartial advice in cybersecurity. So if you like what we do and you want to help us out, please follow us on whatever platform you're listening to us on right now. Thank you, and let's get into the episode. If you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. This podcast is my attempt to document lessons from cybersecurity experts who can go deeper than most on critical topics. My hope is that you use these insights to fortify your business and grow your career, and maybe one day partner with SIFT to select your next cybersecurity vendor. I hope you share and enjoy. Jeff, welcome to the No BS Cybersecurity Podcast. I am honored to have you on as a guest for the audience members who maybe don't follow you on LinkedIn yet. Who are you? What do you do? And how did you get here? Yeah, thank you so much. And thanks for inviting me today. Um, so I'm Jeff Brown. I'm the Chief Information Security Officer for the state of Connecticut. Uh, but my background actually goes back quite a bit further than that. Uh, I've been in the cybersecurity space for about 26 years now. Mm -hmm. um, and most of that was actually in financial institutions in the, in the private sector. So, so both public, private sector, very involved in the industry. Um, I've also written a couple books on, the, on, on a few security topics, as well as one on IT leadership. Um, but I, I love giving back to the industry and I'm looking forward to our conversation today. Amazing. So Jeff, let's talk about the security leadership playbook. Why did you write it? What went into that? What inspired you? Yeah. So, so leading the digital workforce is, uh, probably the one you're talking about. That is actually, that was an interesting story because it started out very much being security leadership. The, mm -hmm. the publisher had sort of asked me to write something on, security leadership or just leadership, right? And what we what we determined when we went through it, the process was that a lot of leadership concepts, um, you know, a lot of them apply not only to, to security, but also to general leadership, also to IT leadership. And, and we settled on IT leadership really being the important part of it because IT versus other industries obviously has a lot of change that, that comes in. I think when you're in medicine or healthcare, things like that, uh, you know, your, your industry doesn't upend itself every couple of years the way IT yeah. does. So there's a lot of just uncertainty, ambiguity. And then what we're also seeing, which is unfortunate, but the younger generation not really being that interested in some cases in pursuing leadership paths. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and a lot of different reasons for that, everything from work-life balance to uh, just general preference to, uh, you know, there's just a lot of different reasons for that. So one of the things I wanted to do was be able to share some of the experiences that I've had in the industry, as well as talking to others, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, this isn't a book that I wrote in a silo. We talked to a lot sure. of CIOs and CEOs and, and got their views on, on leadership. And, and leadership's a funny, it's a funny term because even one of the things I found out right away was that even on the CEO level, the chief executive officer level, a lot of people didn't have the same kind of definition for what is leadership, right? And it's a very basic question, but everybody's got a very different view of that. And, you know, really being able to codify some of this stuff, put it in a book and, and get it out there. That's, that's been a very reward, rewarding experience for me. Yeah, I, I imagine so. And given that this is the No BS Cybersecurity Podcast, I, I want to get your thoughts, right, from the Jeff Brown School of Hard Knocks what is leadership to you? How do you define it? Yeah, and, and great question, right? And one of the things is about stewardship and, and making things better than they were when you got there. Um, you know, to me, the ultimate test of a leader is did you make it better under your watch? Um, you know, and that's not to say in cybersecurity, of course, there's there's things that can happen that, that uh, you know, aren't necessarily a failure of leadership, but just a chain of events. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if a breach happens, that's one thing. But how your leadership is during a breach is very different. Right. Like that, that's something that is under your control. Um, so, so really the, the general leadership principles, I think, uh, you know, carry across multiple disciplines, but in cybersecurity, especially, we have so many different things that we have to lead. We have to lead training and awareness. We have to lead during a breach, to lead during an incident. Um, you know, it, it's, it's a lot of, of things and a lot of what we do is cross company. 
Meaning that, like, you know, if we work in databases, we get to largely focus on our own area. But if we work in cybersecurity, we have to look at networking. We have to look at applications. We have to look across the entire company and also be able to communicate all the way down to every single employee. Very few disciplines have to do that. Uh, many, many even business functions don't need to talk to every single person in the company. And ours, ours does. So that's a, that's a really big challenge for some people, especially people in IT security who have come up through that IT background, right? They don't necessarily have all of the, the soft skills and the communication skills that are required in some of these jobs. And it, it can be tough. There's a lot of stakeholders. They have a lot of different expectations. We have to translate all of this knowledge that we know. And we, we've learned a lot in security. 26 years in security, I've learned a lot. But sure, I, have, yeah. I have also had to learn how to translate that and how to make sure I'm connecting with people who have no background in the subject at all in some cases. So we have to really get down to that level where where uh, we can make, make the message clear, help people understand what their cyber risks are, and, and then also put it in actionable terms where they can kind of go do something about it. So it's a big challenge for a lot of people. Yeah, absolutely. And I see that quite a bit in cybersecurity. One of the things that I talk about is how complicated it's become. And it's not just the, the technical aspects, which of course you have to go and learn and, and you have to understand and, and get in the nitty gritty. But then even in the marketplace, it seems like, vendors and marketing teams and analyst firms are adding to the complexity with all of these acronyms and categories. How difficult is it just to stay up to date on the newest terms and, and acronyms going on in the space? I mean, how difficult is that when you're managing you know, a full-time role as, as, let's say, a CISO? Yeah, no, what a good question too. And it's, it's, it's difficult. There's a lot that changes. And, you know, if I kind of look back in time, 25 years ago, it's like things were pretty simple back then. The internet wasn't really that big. Um, you know, now you fast forward and, and you kind of look at like, well, now my refrigerator's on the internet. The toaster's got an IP address. Um, you know, you have all of this different stuff. The attack footprint has grown astronomically. And it's interesting because if you look back at, at some of the skill sets, uh, you know, a long time ago, I was like the Four, I'm, I'm the 4,000th, I think, uh, CISSP that was minted out there. So I, I got my CISSP back in, in 1999. That's a very, very different threat environment than what we're living in today. You look at today, now the attack footprint has, has become so big and, and mm -hmm. a lot of it is opportunistic. So, so things that are now, that, that have never been on the internet are now on the internet. We have to worry about all of that kind of stuff. And even though there's now more people in the industry who do cybersecurity, the problem's gotten a lot bigger. So it's not just financial institutions anymore. It's hospitals, it's education. It's all of the different industries now. And, and almost everybody, anybody who has a digital business in any way, shape or form has to worry about cybersecurity. And yet when we look at like kind of the small medium enterprises, they may have they may have nobody in, in place who's, who's full time on that. They may have part time IT people, um, you know, so really looking at, at how things have evolved over the years has been really interesting. But I mean, it used to be that a handful of people could work in the banks and, yeah. and you had pretty good cybersecurity. And now now all of a sudden everybody needs one of these pros and, and it's there's just not enough people out there. Yeah. So what is the market to do? Great question. Um, I can tell you what Connecticut's doing. So uh, Connecticut, we're, we're doing a product called the, uh, the Connecticut Cyber Hub. And the Connecticut Cyber Hub is something that's a, a partnership with private industry. Uh, we, have, we have Microsoft, we have Splunk, we have IQ4 is the company that's running a lot of the actual technology behind the hub. Mm -hmm. And really what we're looking to do is to tap into the uh, underserved, underprivileged, and, and really be able to get them up to speed on a, on a skills-based learning. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of times in, in cyber, we're hiring by degrees, we're hiring by certifications. We're not hiring by skills, like what can you actually yeah. do? So one of the one of the principles of the cyber hub is that we're we're trying to get people up to speed on not only cybersecurity technology, of course that's important, but working in a team is important, soft skills are important, communication is important. Um, the, the hub is kind of designed in a way that we're trying to get people working together in cohorts and they do uh, you know capstone projects. Uh, very interactive, and then a mentor, and then the mentor piece I think is critical. So somebody like me is on the other end of that. And we have a, a large network of mentors who, who plug into this, 
And they're able to give real time feedback to the students in terms of, uh, you know, I'll give you an example. In some cases, we get uh, capstone projects and they're, you know, they start talking to, you know, this is what we would say to the press. And, and you, you know, in, in a real company, you don't necessarily you want to control that messaging very carefully. Uh, and in many cases, you know, they don't even want the CISO talking to the press. They want public relations talking to the press. So giving them that kind of reality check. Uh, on, on how a real business works. And then at the end of that, they hopefully land into either an internship or into better yet a full-time job because we have corporate sponsors who are, um, you know, and, and, and really all we're doing is connecting the dots. We have, we have corporate sponsors who are trying to hire people and they just can't find them. We have students trying to break into cyber. And we also have educational institutions who may be doing a pretty good job of getting people educated, but less of a good job in terms of connecting them to actual internships and to positions and to you know getting into the workforce and getting productive. So the Cyber Hub is really like focused on that, and um, you know so far we we just launched it uh, this past year. Uh, it's been I, I think a lot of interest in it. We actually have education institutions coming to us. We have vendor partners who want to help support it. Uh, what we are hoping is that we can help scale this on a national level. One of the, uh, if you look at the White House's cybersecurity strategy for uh, for this year, one of the one little tidbits in it said that you know until we've hit a point where any capable American can pursue a, a career in cybersecurity, we're just not there yet, and 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 we're not there yet. So we're we're starting to move the needle in Connecticut, and we we hope that this could be a model that the the rest of the nation could follow. Yeah. And and it sounds like the cyber hub is kind of like an accelerator program for cybersecurity. And you go exactly. through this boot camp and you learn quickly and you learn the real life applications and use cases. You work with a mentor and then there's some connections after the program of people that are looking for talent and looking for aspiring cybersecurity enthusiasts. Am, am I understanding that correctly or what did I miss? Yeah, no, that's exactly right. And in fact, we're, we're starting to plug in some of the vendor content, which is another area where, where institute, like education tends to not have as much focus on, hey, here's how you use Cisco or Microsoft and stuff like that. So we're, we're, we're working with vendor partners to get some of their content in there as well. Mm. Um, but you're exactly right. I mean, it's an accelerator program. It's something that, uh, you know, students can go through. It's aligned, you know, they, they can get industry certifications like Security Plus. We have uh, in alignment with them. Uh, a lot of the, the program and the actual curriculum is in, in harmony with the NICE framework, which is from NIST. Uh, so we're not making stuff up. We're, we're using industry standard things and, and trying to get people up to speed faster so that they can become more productive uh, you know, in the field of cybersecurity and, and really good feedback so far on, on from the students, which is the most important part. Yeah. And I can hear in your voice and and see on your face when you started talking about this it seems like it, it means something to you it, what what does it mean to you you know it's it's funny um my career started before cybersecurity, I used to work in a publishing house and, and a lot of when when the internet was just starting to be a thing but it was still dial up um, I was involved pretty heavily in distance learning and distance learning back then looked like a CD-ROM that we mail you. Um, so, so things yeah. have changed a lot and, you know, going, going like 26 years later, being able to kind of go back to like, Hey, how do we do distance learning and bring up the next generation? That is an exciting topic for me. Um, the other thing is I wasn't born knowing cybersecurity. A lot of people feel like it's, Oh, it's so complicated and there's all this stuff and it is right. But it's a lifetime of learning. Um, what I know from 20 years ago isn't that useful for what I know today. Um, you know, so it's it's something that you have to continuously learn. You have to continuously kind of keep on top of things. And those are the people who succeed the most in cybersecurity. People who are just interested in things, not only how they work, but how they break. Um, those are the people who tend to do the best in cybersecurity. And, you know, just being able to kind of give that back, um, you know, and, and help that next generation. In some cases, I've gotten on some calls with students. They just want to talk to like, what would it be like in an interview for cyber? You know, what do you look for to hire people? You know, what are the qualities? So, you know, things like that. And, uh, you know, just giving them a chance to have somebody who's been there, done that. And now you can talk to them and ask questions and interact with them. It's uh, it's it's rewarding for on, on both sides, right? Like it's yeah. a really good match. Absolutely, and and I think there will always be demand for cybersecurity expertise, right? It, it's only going one way, at least as we've seen historically. 
Yeah, you know, a lot of people worry about AI and stuff like that. And it's like, you know, that's that's great. That will help more people get more involved. It will also introduce a whole host of new problems. Yeah. Um, yeah, all, all, all that's going to happen is is that people will have to learn in a different way and, and that they'll have to maybe learn different things. And, and maybe some things like pouring through logs, looking for like little abnormalities, that kind of stuff's going to be automated. Mm -hmm. But what isn't? It seems like you had a... Uh... That was one half of the equation is th these sorts of things might be able to be automated, but where will the still where will there still be gaps where human expertise is really needed? Yeah. And, uh, you know, there's an element of creativity that comes into this as well. Um, you know, again, I think one of the attributes of, of somebody who's going to succeed in cybersecurity is, is, is somebody who really looks at something holistically, not only in how it works, but how it breaks. Let's take a real example. A lot of people are all excited about uh, GPTs. I can now create my own GPT and feed it information. And, the, you know, the clever people have already gone in there and said, like, well, if I just kind of prompt it in just the right way to say, like, hey, what, what's the original prompt? What's some of the training material? Uh, suddenly we're seeing that the model will cough up some of the training material and it might be sensitive. Um, that kind of curiosity will take you very far in cyber. Um, you know, it's not only how things work, but how it breaks. And things are going to keep breaking. I don't see that changing even with uh, with AI. And in fact, uh, you know, I see a whole host of new kinds of problems that are going to come. And that stuff really can't be automated. Um, human creativity, you still got to prompt AI to do something, right? It's, it's not necessarily doing anything by itself. So I, I think people who can use and leverage it um, are going to do, do great in this industry. And, and also it's going to create a new set of learning opportunities in the way that we learn, because now we can sort of drill into very detailed course curriculum that, that might be, uh, I, I think, an, an interesting addition maybe to the cyber hub at some point. Yeah. And, and I want to kind of go deeper into your imagination, and I won't hold you to this prediction, but I'm curious if you imagine what the world looks like in 10 years, 15 years, and AI has now been around for a long time. It's very, very advanced. What sort of threats do you think we're going to be facing? Because not only the good guys are going to have access to AI, but the bad guys too. And yeah. how can they cobble together solutions and in, in ways to social engineer and, and things like that using AI? What's kind of on the horizon for us in, in your imagination? Yeah, and the future, what do they say? The future is faster than you think. Um, yeah. Some of that stuff's here right now. I mean, we've seen special purpose built uh, fraud GPT is a good example. You know, things that are, you know, what they're doing is they're taking these AI models. And while we are trying to put guardrails on these models, uh, you know, bias controls, mm -hmm. data privacy, sensitivity, all of that kind of stuff, they're taking those guardrails off and they're training it specifically on how do I write phishing emails? How do I write malware? Um, you, you know, people are training AI right now to do some really bad things, but like on the product side too, we're seeing more and more stuff. I think you're going to see stuff from Microsoft. We have abnormal security. We have CrowdStrike, you know, where AI is being built into some of these tools. And uh, that's just going to make the tools better and our defense is more automatic. Like right now, I think in cyber, we, we just don't see enough automation uh, happening. And, and, and unfortunately, attacks happen when they happen. So if it happens on, on uh, you know, Thanksgiving, um, you know, which is coming up around the corner for us, uh, that, that's something that you're going to have to get people on the phone. You're going to have to, like, you know, pull people off of uh, family dinners to, to help uh, address something. Wouldn't it be better if a lot of that stuff was either automated or at least triaged so that it wasn't just some trivial event that, that pulled you out of your Thanksgiving? Uh, it's, it's something that's very clearly a, a problem that needs attention. So reducing yeah. false positives. Uh, automatically reacting to things that are just simple to, to automatically react to. I think all of that stuff is here now. It's just not really that, that uh, widespread, I guess, is, is really yeah. the way that I look at it. But uh, I think very shortly you're going to see, you're already seeing it. The vendors are, are under pressure to add AI to their products. Um, so that's going to continue. I, I, I see that. Is the market ready for that? <laughs> is it ready for that? Not really. I mean, you know, and you look kind of state by state, and, and some states are banning AI or putting moratoriums in place, uh, passing legislation on it. Uh, they're looking at it at the federal level as well. Like I said, we're busy putting all of these guardrails on it, and then other people are busy taking it off. Um, yeah. So so at some point, that's got to reconcile. That's got to balance itself out a little bit better. And I think that that will happen. 
Uh, but the the genie's sort of out of the bottle. I mean, uh, everybody focuses on on uh, you know ChatGPT and things like that. But I mean, there's so many models out there, many of which you can just pull offline and run it locally uh, and take all those guardrails off. So people, we know people are doing that right now, and and uh, that's going to continue. We have to make sure that on the defense side that we're also leveraging these kind of tools. And I could tell you, even on my own team, I've seen. You know, people are, are running some queries and they're pulling out and, you know, guys are pulling out Q radar rules that we put into our SIM. Um, that's really great. Like, I, I don't think they, they necessarily had that skill and now they do. Um, so what we've done is uplifted our, our people with uh, you know, careful use of AI, right? Like we don't want to necessarily put any sensitive data at risk. We don't want to compromise our security, but we can use this as a tool that can help us right now. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I want to stay on the topic of the tools and solutions. And at SIFT, we call a lot of the tools in the market overkill, right? We we primarily focus on startups and SMBs, and that's who we're really talking to. That's who we want to help with their cybersecurity. And it feels like a lot of the larger companies, even the CrowdStrikes and, and the Splunks of the world, like they are fantastic. They're so good. They're so advanced, but they feel like overkill for the 50 person floral shop in, in Lincoln, Nebraska, right? So where are there opportunities for startups and, and other cybersecurity experts to build platforms that are more in alignment with the skill set of like a small business owner, where they don't have to have a PhD in cybersecurity to protect 50 endpoints? Like, are, are there any opportunities for companies to come in and disrupt that space by actually going the other way and simplifying cybersecurity rather than adding on more complexity and more advancements. Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head. That's that the the small and medium businesses are are they've become I think kind of the new focus point. Um, you know, hospitals, education, you know, things like that that are just getting hit by ransomware and they don't know what to do and they don't necessarily even even know who to call. Uh, so that small medium business market is is pretty important, I think. On the, on the state level, one of the things that we are doing is that, uh, and every state's doing this uh, with with maybe one or two exceptions. But I mean, there's something called the whole of state cybersecurity strategy, and what's happening is that federal federal funds are coming to the states, and we're able now to cascade those down to some of the municipalities. So that works very well on the mm -hmm. on the public sector side of things. We're we're going to be working with uh, you know a lot of our our towns and municipalities in terms of getting them sustainable controls in place. Um, mm -hmm. and, and a lot of that may look like a virtual CISO. It may look like, um, you know, maybe a managed crowd strike, things like that, that are, that are just easy for them to digest. I think when you look at like state government, you're going to see, you know, some, some pretty decent security controls. When you look at a town or a municipality, you might see an IT director mm -hmm. who, who works part-time. Uh, that's not that uncommon, uh, no cybersecurity people, right? So how do you get on their agendas and how do you make sure that, uh, you know, that they are, have the right controls in place? For us, we have a public sector ISP in the state that is, uh, you know, called Connecticut Education Network or CEN. Uh, that is for us a choke point where if we can put more security controls on CEN, now, now suddenly every subscriber benefits from that and they don't have to do too much. We're very cognizant that the more we're asking, especially a small and medium business to do, you're absolutely right. If it's too complicated, they'll just say like, well, that's probably not for me or I'll have to think about that. I mean, what we need is we need people taking action today on very simple things like, you know, as, a, as an example, you can plug in a secure DNS um, that's pretty simple to do. You might need some help if you have no idea how to do that, but it's it's something that can be implemented in a single day and you've just made cybersecurity better. Sometimes we, we overcomplicate cyber and, and there are some simple steps, uh, multi-factor authentication, things like that. I mean, that comes up over and over again, but you got to actually enable it and go out and do it. Um, yeah. And the, you know, giving them a, a venue to ask questions or help or maybe a little bit of assistance, just getting stuff set up. I think that would go along. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think you you really called it out with just take care of the simple steps. The A lot of these businesses don't need to hire a SWAT team to guard their parked car in the driveway while they're asleep. Like lock your doors, roll your windows up, have a car alarm. If someone tries to walk down your road and they're jiggling door handles, well, they're probably going to move on because you don't have the vulnerabilities. And they're going to move on until they find someone who does. 
And so I feel like for the smaller business, it's more about cyber hygiene than cyber complexity. And if you have MFA, you have EDR and incident response retainer and some cyber insurance, you're probably in pretty good shape. And you don't need the overkill of a, of a Splunk and then to hire an entire separate company to then manage that tool for you. I mean, how true do you think that is? Or am I way off there and how I'm thinking about it? No, I think you're exactly right. I might add patching and maybe some awareness on don't clicking on links. Um, you, you know, th- and that's a short list. That was what, like five, six things that you can go do right now. Patching is free. That, you, you don't necessarily need to go hire a cyber expert to go patch known vulnerabilities. And yet we still see that most cyber attacks are coming in through known vulnerabilities. Hey, it's James here. Really quick, well done for making it to the midpoint of the episode. If you're enjoying what you're hearing right now, remember to drop us a follow. And if you're really enjoying it, please leave us a review. With that said, let's get back to the episode. Is that something that AI can help with? Because I know it's like the volume of patches and the prioritization of the patches is really the bottleneck for a lot of companies. Is that something that AI could take care of? Is it low enough of a lift that we could trust AI agents to be able to execute some of those patches effectively? Or is that something that really does need a human to sift through all of these vulnerabilities and prioritize them and then take the actions? Yeah, there's some complexity there. I think uh, I think for most people, just a, you know, small medium business, they're they're going to get away with just turning on automatic updates, right? Like it's as simple as that. Um, where things get a lot more complicated is in a business that maybe codes their own applications, right? They they develop mm-hmm. their own software. Uh, now all of a sudden, if I deploy a fix, it might break that software. So things need to be tested, and we need a process. We might need development and production servers so that we can you know make sure that we're not breaking the business uh, that's where the complexity comes and that's where ai might be able to help so i don't see it helping as much on the small medium kind of businesses but i actually see it helping a little bit more on maybe some of the bigger businesses who have to look at like you know let's say thirty thousand vulnerabilities that need to be patched yeah. and how do i prioritize you know what's first second and third ai is going to be very good at that mm-hmm what about the actual execution of pushing the patch out? Is that something that still needs human review or is there a world where AI is advanced enough to be able to make that call? I would say I would um I would say that you know again I think automatic updates for most is is plenty uh but that you know AI can certainly I think help on this subject uh, you know again I think you, you end up with a lot of complexity in patching and, and things can break very quickly and then there's also just so many of these I mean I, I could tell you scenarios where uh large companies have, have patched and they they reduce their their vulnerabilities by a thousand and then two thousand new ones show up and suddenly it looks like well we went up a thousand not down um mm-hmm. You know, and it looks like people aren't doing their jobs, but it's actually just that there was a huge volume of vulnerabilities. And, and where AI, I think, could really help with that is, is really being able to correlate what should I patch first, second or third? What's in the wild? What are attackers actually using? Not just like, hey, some vulnerability that's a little bit academic in nature. And a lot of those are like, you, you know, you, I, you could take an example of uh, encryption downgrade attacks. It's like, well, that's a fairly technical attack. It's probably going to happen with a, a, a sophisticated attacker who's targeting you explicitly. That's not going to happen at your mom and shop, mom and pop kind of shops. Um, you know, AI can do a lot more, I think, in in those kind of cases. Yeah, absolutely. And so, when you're thinking about startups, it's a kind of a unique domain because they're the size of a mom and pop shop a lot of times, but they are coding their own applications. Their IP means everything to them. Maybe it's a biotech startup, right? Where their entire valuation is based on their unique IP um, and their intellectual property. So what do you think about those businesses in terms of their cybersecurity needs? Is it, hey, just maintain cyber hygiene at your level? You know, you're, you're 35 people, you guys have valuable IP, but just take care of your cyber hygiene. Or do those companies really need to be acting like some of the larger enterprise organizations in terms of their defense? Yeah, what we're what we're finding is that uh, the answer is unfortunately, yeah, you, you you need to do that. The smaller the company is, what we've found is that a cyber attack can it can put you out of business. I mean, if you lose everything, it's all encrypted, it's all been stolen or destroyed. Um, do you have 
uh, replaceable backups. If not, you, you might just be out of luck, right? Like, I mean, all your IP has been destroyed and the company is sort of out of business. Um, you, you know, that's not going to happen to a giant Fortune 500 company. They're going to bounce back. Um, you know, these smaller companies, though, I mean, they're, they're the ones who are the most at risk because what they have to do is, is make sure that they can get something up and running. And there's two mindsets here. There's the development mindset, which is like, oh, cool, we made this work. This is amazing. And then there's the security mindset that says, great, now how can we break it? What would an attacker do to, to it? So you have to have both of those mindsets. And a lot of times the smaller companies are just so focused on like, we need to get the software built and we need to get it functional. We need to get it up and running. And they're not so focused on like, how could it break? Who could maybe like, you know, in, in the interim, like maybe like mess up our company, you know, by, by either destroying data or, or asking for a ransom that, that maybe that just can't be paid. They just don't have that money to pay that. Um, you know, those are all of the kind of challenges we see. So, you know, I think that, the needle's kind of shifting from, you know, hey, some of the big companies now are really pretty well fortified. That doesn't make them immune. Nothing makes you immune mm -hmm. to cyber attacks, but they're pretty well fortified. They have big security teams. They're thinking about third party risk. They're looking at, you know, DLP and patching and all this kind of stuff. And then you got the little guys who are, are just like, what am I supposed to do? I'm not sure. And, and we have to get the word out more to those people who aren't sure, like, hey, here's maybe five things that you could do and, and two of them you could do today. Go back right now and do it. Mm hmm. Yeah, I, I think they know they need cybersecurity, but they find it too complicated or too expensive. And especially in the startup world, they end up trading safety for speed. And someone needs to come in and say, hey, you don't have to do that anymore. Here's a platform that makes it super easy for you to ingest your MFA logs, ingest your EDR logs, maintain your vulnerability and patching in a nice, easy to use box, right? Where they don't have to hire three people at an MSP to manage Splunk for them. Like there should be simpler solutions. And I think we're kind of at this tipping point in the market where people want to go the other way and they want more simplification. They want one click downloads for reporting, right? Or when we have an audit, I should be able to just click a button and have all of my information for that audit. Right. And traditionally, it's been so manual and people are pulling out informations and using using Excel spreadsheets to organize themselves. But do you feel like there is a reality where the market does take a shift to go more towards simple user interfaces for versus the more complicated tools that were built by experts for experts? Is anyone going to build for the average person who doesn't know a lot about cybersecurity? Yeah, they need to, is, is kind of the short answer. Um, the, the reality is that uh, the, the complexity, and I'm going to just refer to it as, as sort of friction, right? Like friction is, Ooh, is something yeah. that stops me from doing something as opposed to helps me from doing something. Um, there's a lot of friction right now when you want to implement cybersecurity in, in, in a small company, right? Like you may not have support at the top. You may, uh, you may have all of these kind of challenges that are coming up. You may not have a big budget so that you can go out and get things. That's all friction that's going to slow you down and, and stop you from protecting your data and, and protecting the company. So, you know, when we, when we really look at that, uh, I'll give you an example. I, I advise a, a small cyber insurance company that, that's actually targeted for small, medium businesses called Cowbell Cyber. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and Cowbell, like a lot of times people will start the cybersecurity conversation by saying, I need cyber insurance, right? So, so Cowbell is a great place to go for small, medium businesses. Um, but it's in nobody's best interest. A lot of people think of cyber insurance as like, that's a primary control. If something happens, we have cybersecurity uh, insurance, right? And, and that's, that's after the fact, right? Like your data is already mm -hmm. gone at this point. Now you're going to have to wait and get, get, get payments back from your insurer. Maybe you can rebuild, maybe you can't. Uh, you know, that check is, is going to come, but it's not going to be a big help if you don't have any of your data anymore. Um, they know that too. So a lot of like the, these smaller insurers are really starting to push like, you know, hey, we've got, we're, we're giving you security information, right? We want to give you threat intelligence. Uh, we want to make products available at a discount that we think are easy to use. Um, you, you know, any recommendations on stuff like that or, or the ability to talk to somebody. I think in the future, maybe even more like virtual CISO or VCISO. Uh, services where it's like, hey, maybe we need someone to come in, not full time, but part time. Maybe we just pay for their, 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 their bandwidth to help set up a program, maybe talk to the board, stuff like that. That's just very basic. 
and then they go help another small company, right? So, so that whole market of virtual CISO has been spinning up and it's an interesting one to watch as well. Uh, but it really helps the smaller companies that are just like, you know, look, uh, what, what does your average CISO make? You know, hundreds of thousands of dollars, right? Like, and some of these companies are like, I can't afford that. What do I do? Um, mm -hmm. You know, and, and, and there needs to be an answer for them. Yeah, absolutely. And there's, I think it starts with where you have uh, a wide body of skill is in the communication. Why is it so difficult for security practitioners to communicate to the executive C-suite or the board level about cybersecurity and risks? Why is it so complicated? That's a great question, um, and, and I, I actually I wrote a second book on that one called the Security Leaders Communication Playbook. Um, you know, I, I think I started earlier by saying I wasn't born knowing cybersecurity. Uh, mm -hmm. My education background had nothing to do with IT. IT was a hobby, though, so I, I did all kinds of IT work all the time, but a lot of my educational background was in communications. And, and that, I, I can tell you, is one of the most helpful things in this industry right now because everybody needs to understand cybersecurity, and yet there's not that many of us who can explain it in, in simple enough terms that they, they really kind of get what you're saying. Um, the complexity of some of the things that we have to learn is, is pretty extreme. Um, and, and what we end up doing is we come in with the tech talk, you know, we're, we're talking about like, you know, encryption algorithms and stuff like that. It's like your average business user has no idea, like, how does encryption work again? I don't understand this. Um, and they're looking for very simple answers. Like, you know, if I give you X amount of money to put in X many controls, how much more secure are we? And, and, and we have a lot of struggle with that kind of a, a question. It's a very basic, simple question. Like, you know, maybe we put a million dollars into our cybersecurity program. How much more secure are we? Um, that is a simple question that you'll get from business leaders. And, and yet many of us don't really have an answer for that. That's, that's really easy to, to get across talk too many acronyms, stuff like that. I mean, there's just so many things that we have to learn. And a lot of times people love kind of showing their knowledge, like, you know, hey, DLP and EDR and, uh, you know, SIM. And it, people have no idea what you're talking about. They think you might as well be talking Greek. Why can't you provide a simple answer to that question? Hey, if we invest a million dollars, how much more secure are we? Why is it so difficult to answer that question for a security officer or CISO? Yeah. Uh, and, and the answer is because I think business leaders are looking for, we're good, right? Like we don't have to worry about this anymore. Uh, we, we spent money on it. The problem went away, right? And the answer is no, it didn't. In fact, we have to do layered controls. We may have to buy many different things. Um, you know, and just because we have a firewall doesn't mean that we don't need an EDR and all the, all the other things that were going to be the acronym soup of all the, the security mm -hmm. technology that we talk about. What, what is more helpful and productive with senior business leaders is talking about maturity, talking about competitors, um, you, you know, here's where you stand, here's where they stand. Um, you know, not everybody needs to be an A plus student in cybersecurity. Um, some companies are okay with, you know, we're gonna be a B, we definitely don't wanna be an F, uh, but, yeah. but, you know, we don't necessarily need to be best in class either. But I, I think, that, you know, again, there's probably like five or six things that people can do that would just put them in a much better situation uh, without having to go into all of those kind of details. But, uh, you know, simple questions, why don't we patch everything everywhere all the time? That's a really tough question to answer in a big company, right? You might have thousands of vulnerabilities. You'd be patching like all the time, trying to test systems, make sure nothing breaks. Uh, it, there's a lot of complexity to that that business leaders don't understand. So it's up to us to come up with a way to, to make that make sense uh, to them. Uh, you know, in many cases, we're using metaphors and, you know, everybody loves the, the doors and windows and, and things. I tend to use air brakes, you know, brakes on the, on the car and airbags and stuff like that. Uh, that's what security is. Nobody wants to buy security. They want the car. I want a really fast car, but I don't necessarily want to have no seatbelts, no airbags and no brakes. Um, you, you know, those are the security controls that come with the car. But what I really want is the car. So as business leaders and, and cyber leaders, we need to get together and, and make sure that we're really focused on how do we make the business safe? How do we protect our assets? And then what security controls make the most sense in that context? Because mm -hmm. everything in, and you don't understand this until you run your own business, but like. Everything is an expense, including cybersecurity. So how much is enough? 
Um, you know, and, and uh, if I'm making cutbacks, should it be on, in, in there or should it be in development or should it be in marketing? You know, those are the kind of trade-offs that business leaders have to make. And not, not enough CISOs really appreciate the, that complexity of like, you know, it's a, it's a difficult economy right now. Uh, we, we might not be spending a lot of stuff. And, and then you're coming to them with these risks and we want to throw products at all these risks. Uh, you got to make sure that those risks are in alignment with like the actual needs of the business. And that's, I think, where it's one of the most difficult things we face in the industry right now. It's like our business leaders don't know enough about cyber and our cyber leaders don't know enough about business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I can see that disconnect. And it feels like the CISOs who really align themselves with the business are ingrained in the vision for where the company is going. And how can we go there safely? And the CISOs who aren't aligned with the vision are looking at it as, I'm just looking at our threat landscape and where do I feel like we're most vulnerable? And both things are required and needed. But it sounds like you're saying that CISOs need to try to align themselves more with the vision and how they protect themselves along the journey of growth versus nitpicking every single thing that they could be doing to shore up their security posture. Am I putting words in your mouth or am I understanding that correctly or how would you say it? No, not at all. I think you're, uh, I think you're spot on. Um, let's take my example. I work in state governments. Um, one of the things that's really important with state government right now is something called digital government. And, and what that means is that services need to be available 24 seven, they need to be online, they need to be mobile friendly. And, and that's really important to the, you know, if the state is considered a business, that's our business. You know, our, we're in the business of serving citizens and making sure that they can get the services that they need. Um, my business now is to make sure that those services are secure because we can't, they, they can't be available, they can't be safe, they can't be private if, if, uh, if they're chock full of security vulnerabilities. So, so now my alignment, it becomes very simple, right? Like, I mean, I'm aligned with digital government. A lot of what we do is supporting that. And of course, there's a bunch of other things that we have to do, like training and awareness for all employees and, and, and stuff like that. But it's, it's now a conversation I can have that's very much in alignment of like, here's where the organization's going, here's where the cyber program's going, and we're heading in the, in the same direction, like we're actually working together, um, you know, and it's a, it's a big opportunity, I think, for also funding. If the business is spending uh, on, on building something, new products, new things like that, I mean, that's, that's where we need to plug in and be able to say like, hey, you know, we're gonna uplift all of our security by, by really focusing on some of the business objectives that we're doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you touched on cyber awareness training a couple of times so far in our conversation, and I may be a contrarian in this opinion. I think cyber awareness is going to go not completely away, but the next generation as they come up, they're so tech savvy. I mean, I, I the 25 and below, I don't feel like they're clicking on links that they shouldn't like they I feel like they can spot it from a mile away. Is that wishful thinking? Or is there something to the different generations and how they interact with the internet and people who grew up with it versus someone who maybe didn't and is more susceptible to sending 13 grand to an African prince to help him out of a bad situation? <laughs> Yeah, no, the, uh, and, and that generational thing, I, I, I hate putting people in buckets, but there are, there is some truth to that. Um, where, where things get interesting though, uh, there's so many different perspectives when we look at risk and, and risk is a really interesting subject. It's about what can go wrong or what we don't know that could happen. Um, and I'll give you an example. There was a big ransomware. I'm not going to even say where, but I mean, like the reality was, was that a lot of the younger generation didn't know how to, how to spell things they didn't know they don't know handwriting in some cases right like i mean that's not you know they know how to type on a keyboard but guess what all the computers are encrypted um you, you know what we're seeing is actually the, the challenges on both sides of that equation so i mean i, I think it's a it's a complex subject, um, you know, but uh, the attackers are adapting too. a lot of them are now doing things like social media. They're doing SMS messaging. Um, hopefully people are, are relatively, you know, have a good dose of that kind of paranoia. But I mean, I can tell you it's a numbers game. 
Um, if if one percent of people are going to click on an email, which is that, that's wishful thinking right there, right? I mean, it's usually yeah. it's usually a double digit number. I only need a couple. You know, if I send out a million of these things, I'm going to have a whole bunch of suckers on the other end of that. And that's that's really how the the numbers game of this works. It's like you you need everybody to be sort of educated on it. Now, on awareness, I think that that is um, you know it, you got to be practical with awareness. Um, I, I would say that if I wanted all of our um, state employees to know only one thing, it's like, hey, how do I report a cyber incident? How do I how do I find somebody if I see something strange? How do I do that? If 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 your employees can't answer that question, that's a big big problem, right? Because now now they can't necessarily report a cyber incident. Now, if we can get them not you know be paranoid about clicking on links, don't lose your laptop. I mean, there's a whole bunch of other things that we can throw into that, and some of it's going to stick, and some of it's not. That's why we do awareness and, um, you know, it, uh, you have to be practical about it. Uh, you can't overtrain people and you also just certainly can't expect them to know everything that we know about cybersecurity. Sometimes we over push like we want to teach you everything about it. And it's like, well, they don't necessarily want to learn everything about it. So we have, yeah. to, kind of, you know, have to kind of balance that. Like, what's the bare minimum I need to know? If I, if I said that to almost anybody, any company, any state, it's like, how do you report a cybersecurity problem? If you see something that's weird, how do you let somebody know about it? And if you can answer that, training is at least in a good starting position. Anything that you can do above that, fantastic. Perfect. And so if you guys are listening out there, I have Jeff Brown. He's the CISO for the state of Connecticut. And I'm going to ask him a practical question right now so tune in if you're taking notes this is where you should really focus jeff you talk about a practical way or system for employees to report security incidents for people who don't have a policy for that today what should they be doing what is the easiest to implement practical way for to have employees report security incidents I love it. Yeah. And um, let's go back to a topic we, we covered a little bit earlier, which is friction. Um, friction is a bad thing. So friction is what's going to stop me from being able to do that. And I'll give you a quick example. Um, when I started in the state, one of the uh, one of the ways that we could report phishing was very complicated. You know, you had to like create a new email and you had to put another email as, on as an attachment. And then you had to send it to some distribution that even we couldn't remember. Um, we, we now have one button click, right? Like, so now all we have to train people to do is, hey, if you think it's a fish, click that button. That's a lot easier to digest than here's a, you know, here's a three page thing on how to report a fish. Um, you, you really need to make sure that it's just very, very simple. And in a small company, it might. Is that button a security tool that you guys have implemented? Yeah, yeah. yeah no, uh, you, you know, Proofpoint and others. I mean, the Microsoft, there's almost everybody who does awareness training has some report fish kind of button. And where does it go? Does it go to Microsoft or Proofpoint or does it go to your team internally? Depends on the product. So it uh, used to go to our team internally, and now we have some other vendor products that, that helps us automatically triage some of the uh, some of what we see. So that, yeah. that again, that's going to be one that's really uh, amazing for AI. And I'll give you an example. One of the very first things I did with, uh, with ChatGPT when I was able to get access to it, um, you know, one of the things I did was I just gave it a, what I thought was a pretty much known fish, but I said like, hey, here's an email, what's fishy about it? And it analyzed the headers and it, it was exactly spot on accurate. Um, what if the email server just did that instead, right? Like what if the email server is able to just say like, hey, that looks like a fish, I'm not sending it to the employee's inbox. That's where we need to be, right? Like it needs to be automatic, it needs to be simple. And, and then if it does land in the inbox and it looks suspicious, I click one button and it's off to, it's off to the security group for analysis. There you go. And all of the future security tools, we need one button clicks, which we'll run automations in the background. Um, this was so awesome, Jeff. Thank you so much for joining. I am very, very excited to go back and watch this and create some clips from it. I'll share those with you as well. Um, Jeff, if there is one thing that you want to shout out to our audience, what is it? Uh, do you have a, another book upcoming? Do you want to talk about one of your previous books, a, a podcast you have coming up? What's going on in your world? Where can people find you? Very good question. I'm, uh, I'm actually looking to, to write a new book. 
Um, I, I'd love to hear from your audience. What, what problems or challenges do you want to see? I mean, when, I, I don't shy away from the big problems. We, we need to tackle those. We need to talk about them uh, and we need to address them. So maybe it'll be something on small, medium business. Maybe it'll be business knowledge for CISOs. Um, happy, to, happy to take some votes on that. Love it. Awesome. Well, Jeff, thank you so much. Uh, you and I will be in touch. I appreciate you joining. My pleasure. Thank you so much. No BS Cybersecurity is brought to you by Sift.ai. Remember to subscribe wherever you listen to your podcasts. On behalf of the team here at Sift, thank you for learning with me.